Right, so hello everyone. You should now be able to see a screen that says relative clauses. I hope that's what's um, coming up. And someone will let me know if it's not. I'm keeping an eye on the um, chat that is there. And today we're going to talk about relative clauses. So this is where a clause, something that has a verb in it, something that might have more than one noun phrase, something that might involve having a subject and an object, is used to modify a noun. So a relative clause is part of a noun phrase. This is at least the way it works in English. It's part of a noun phrase, but it is... Um, <coughs> sorry, I didn't mean to do that. It is part of a noun phrase, but it is a clause, not an adjective or something like that. So, before we talk about relative clauses in particular, I just want to talk about different kinds of sentences that have more than one clause. That is to say, have more than one verb doing something. So, Coordination is where you have two sentences next to each other, something happened and something else happened. Neither of them is dependent on the other. I went to the market and Sally went to uni, university. Okay, that's coordination. Subordination is where one of the sentences relies on one of the others. If Sally goes to the uni, I'll go to the market. So I'll only go to the market if Sally goes to the uni. Sally, if Sally goes to the uni, is what we call a subordinate clause. I'll go to the market is the main clause. Languages do all of these things in different ways from English, incidentally. But this is attempting to explain the different kinds of multi-clausal constructions using um, a kind of functional approach. What is the function? In complementation, we have a clause in the position where a noun phrase would be. So I think that Sally went to uni. We could also say, I saw that Sally went to uni. I believe that Sally went to uni. And we can replace that Sally went to uni with a noun phrase. With the verb think, it's not so easy to do. Um, <clears throat> but you can, for example, if you want to put a sentence with want, I want Sally to go to uni. I want Sally to go to uni. You could replace Sally to go to uni with a noun phrase like I want chocolate or I want um, fish or something like that. Okay, so that Sally went to the to uni is a clause that is taking the place of a noun phrase. And relativization, the Sally who went to uni is my girlfriend. So what we're saying here is, who went to uni is a relative clause that modifies Sally. Okay, the basic sentence is, Sally is my girlfriend. None of these sentences are remotely true, incidentally. They're just made up for the purposes of talking about these different clauses. Sally <clears throat> is my girlfriend is the overall sentence. Who went to uni is a relative clause that modifies Sally. Okay, so the function of relative clauses then is to modify a head noun within a noun phrase. And it often restricts the reference of that noun phrase. So for example, we have the guitar. The guitar is over there. And we can also have, we can add a relative, and that could refer to many different guitars, right? There are guitars all over the place in the world. We could also say the guitar that once belonged to the poet Thomas More. Now, this restricts the meaning to just one guitar, because we can presume that only one guitar belonged to the poet Thomas More. And that once belonged to the poet Thomas More is a part of the noun phrase headed by the guitar. 
In English, relative clauses go after the head noun, but they are part of the noun phrase. Now, this is a photograph of the guitar that once belonged to the poet Thomas More. He lived from 1779 to 1852. And he was, amongst others, a close personal friend of the famous poets, Lord Byron, um, Percy Shelley, John Keats, that I'm sure many of you have heard of. And if anybody has heard of Shelley or Keats or Byron, you can just say hello. Um, but Thomas More was part of the group and he was actually Byron's executor. Now, the reason why I mention this guitar is that the guitar that once belonged to the poet Thomas More, 1779 to 1852, now belongs to me. And I actually meant to bring the physical guitar here. I keep it at my parents' house to show you. If anybody wants to know more about it, there is a nice photo of it. It was built in about 1790. It's not actually in very good condition, but it is a very beautiful thing. Okay, so, but the, the relative clause that once belonged to Thomas More, I'll just go back to that slide for a second, that relative clause that once belonged to the poet Thomas More restricts the reference. Now, it can't refer to just any guitar, it can only refer to this one. Okay, so I've referenced, I mentioned here on slide number five, two references about relative clauses. Um, these, if anybody wants me to send you these readings, I can. So Maggie Tallerman in her textbook about syntax, which we use in the subject that I teach, talks about the function of relative clauses being to restrict. That is to say, being to contract the number of possible references. And Nikolaeva, who wrote a particular article on relative clauses, starts with the distinction between restrictive and non-restrictive as the basic distinction for relative clauses. So we need to talk about, in English at least, restrictive versus non-restrictive relative clauses. They are different things in English, but I'm not sure this distinction works in every language. So the first one is an example of a restrictive relative clause. The man that is a good teacher got a new job or the man who is a good teacher got a new job. The underlying sentence is the man got a new job and this could refer to any man. But when we say the man who is a good teacher got a new job, it restricts the number of men that are being referred to to ones who are re regarded as being a good teacher. So it restricts the meaning. If anybody wants to ask me a question about this restrictive later, this would be a good point to talk about. On the other hand, sentence B, John, who is a good teacher, got a new job. Here, we already know who John is. There is no further restriction. Who is a good teacher is now what is called a non-restrictive relative clause. It adds a bit of additional information to the sentence, but it doesn't restrict it because John is already restricted to someone who we know. John, who is a good teacher, got a new job. If I said this sentence to you, I would be assuming that you already knew who John is. So that's an example of a non-restrictive relative clause. So cross-linguistically, relative clauses are usually used for restrictive purposes. There are probably not that many cases where it's easier to, uh, to identify the non-restrictives in other languages. But in English, restrictive clauses are usually um, headed by common nouns, whereas non-restrictive ones can modify personal pronouns and proper nouns. So if we go back to slide five, John, who is a good teacher, got a new job. Since we already know who John is, this is just add, adding extra information. It is not restricting the references to a particular John. We already know who this particular John is, otherwise we can't say that sentence. It could be a restrictive relative clause if there's more than two Johns that we have been talking about. So let's suppose we have been talking about two people called John. 
One of them is a teacher and a good teacher and the other one isn't. And you want to say the John who is a good teacher got a new job, the other John didn't. And then it restricts the reference. But that is pretty rare with personal names. Putting a the in front of the personal name is pretty rare in English, but it is possible. And pronouns as well, like um, uh, she or he are rarely combined with, um, re with relative clauses. But when they are, they are almost always going to be um, non-restrictive. So let's have a look at, on slide number seven here, some examples. So, and work out which of these, and so you can start answering the question now, A, B, C, D, and E. I've put the relative clauses into bold, and the questions that I want to ask are, are they restrictive relative clauses? Do they further restrict the meaning? Or are they non-restrictive relative clauses? In other words, the meaning is already restricted and we already know who is being referred to. So in the first case, Fred, who likes to eat chocolate, will arrive tonight. So do we already know who Fred is when we said this? On the other hand, the boy who likes to eat chocolate will arrive tonight. In this case, it is, in my view, a restrictive relative clause, because if we just said the boy will arrive tonight, we don't know anything particular about the boy. It could refer to a number of different boys. But when we say the boy who likes to eat chocolate will arrive tonight, it restricts the reference to a boy who we know likes to eat chocolate. So in the case of A, we are talking about a non-restrictive relative clause because Fred is already identified. We do, adding who likes to eat chocolate does not restrict the meaning to any more Freds than it already refers to. Whereas in the case of B, it is a restrictive relative clause. It reduces the possible reference to, um, to who is um, being referred to here. Okay, so I'm hoping that this distinction is um, making sense. I'm trying to keep an eye on um, who is, who has commented in case some comments go through. Okay, so sentence C, there's a boy now in Sydney and that boy who likes to eat chocolate will arrive tonight. So the question here would be, does who likes to eat chocolate further restrict the referent to that boy? And the answer is clearly not, because we already know who the boy is. The boy who's now in Sydney, that boy, which everyone knows who they are, and happens to like to eat chocolate, will arrive to tonight. So the point about these three examples, A, B, and C here, is that although the form of the relative clause is exactly the same as in each of the three sentences A, B, and C, in A and C, they are non-restrictive relative clauses because the, re the referent, the item that is being modified by the relative clause, Fred in A and the boy in C, is already fully understood by the speaker and the listener before the relative clause is added. So it does not restrict the meaning any further. But in the case of B, the boy who likes to eat chocolate, who likes to eat chocolate restricts the meaning of the boy, restricts the reference of the boy to one that um, does like to eat chocolate. If there was another boy that we had been talking about who doesn't like to eat chocolate, it could not refer to them. Similarly with D and E, D is a restrictive relative clause because it restricts the meaning of fox to a particular, the fox that ate our chickens. On the other hand, E, there was once a fierce wild fox and that fox which ate our chickens was killed 
does not further restrict the meaning of the relative clause. So these, these distinctions are important to understand, at least for an analysis of relative clauses in English. But is that going to apply in all cases? Now, I tossed up before making this lecture whether I would keep this slide in, but I decided that I was going to do it because I wanted people to understand that one potential difference between English and other languages is in regard to what arguments can be shared between the main clause and the relative clause. So if we go back to slide number seven, and we look at slide 7b, the boy who likes to eat chocolate will arrive tonight. The boy is an argument in the main clause, the boy will arrive tonight. And the boy is an argument in the relative clause because it's the boy who likes to eat chocolate. So the boy likes to eat chocolate. Okay, so we could divide B into two clauses. The boy likes to eat chocolate and the boy will arrive tonight. Hopefully everyone's clear with me there. So, in English, you can share arguments between the main clause and the relative clause in a multiple different possibility of um, roles. So you can share A arguments, S arguments, and P arguments. So let's just revise and remind ourselves what A, S, and P mean. So, a means the subject of a transitive clause. S means the subject of an intransitive clause. And P means the object of a transitive clause. So in the first example, we have two clauses put together. The boy ate the chocolates, the boy stole the fish. In both cases, the boy is the A argument, the subject of the transitive clause. And therefore, the A argument is shared. And that's why that little bracket at the front has A and A in it. The first A means that um, the first A refers to its position in the relative clause. The second A refers to its position in the main clause. Could have been the other way around, doesn't matter. But we can also say in English, the boy who ate the chocolates is sleeping. And here in the main clause, the boy is the S argument. The boy is sleeping, subject of the um, intransitive subject. And in the um, subordinate clause, the boy ate the chocolates, the relative clause, the boy is the A argument. Or we can say, I hit the boy who ate the chocolates. In this case, the boy is, um, is the P argument, the object of the main clause, I hit the boy, and he is the A argument, the transitive subject of the relative clause, the boy ate the chocolates. Or the boy can be the P argument, can be the object of the relative clause. So the boy that I hit, the relative clause is I hit the boy. So he's the P argument of the relative clause the boy ate the chocolates is the main clause. The boy is the A argument there. So you get the point that I'm saying here that you can share all these different argument possibilities between languages. Many languages, however, won't let you do that. And one of the things that we discover as we study languages other than English is the restrictions on the sharing of arguments between relative clauses and main clauses. I should do the last two here. So the boy that I hit is sleeping. The boy is the P argument or the object of the um, relative clause. I hit the boy. And the boy is the S argument or the intransitive subject of the main clause. The boy is sleeping. Mary kissed the boy that I hit. I make up these examples for the students here in Australia and they kind of like them, I suppose. In, again, in the relative clause, the boy is the P argument or the object. I hit the boy. And the boy is also the P argument or the object of the main clause. 
Mary kissed the boy. Now this sharing, but note that the boy is not present in both clauses. In every case, the boy is part of the main clause, not part of the relative clause. In the relative clause, the boy is replaced by a, um, a gap. And that's important to understand. Okay, now, <clears throat> there are three positions for the head of the noun phrase that contains the relative clause. They can be external. External means they're part of the matrix clause or the main clause. That's what English does. I saw the boy, no, um, the boy that I hit is sleeping. The boy is sleeping is the main class, the main clause or the matrix clause. The boy is part of that clause. The boy isn't, we don't say um, that I hit the boy is sleeping. That would be an internal, internally headed relative clause where the boy is inside the relative clause. You can also have headless relative clauses where the share argument is not expressed. We'll see examples of that shortly. And you can have what's called double marked or correlative. And that would be literally something like um, that boy, um, no, which boy saw the dog, that boy hit me. And that would mean the boy that hit me saw the dog. Which boy saw the dog? That boy hit me. That is what's called a double marked or correlative. And there might be languages that you know that do this. Think about that for a moment while we keep talking. Okay, externally headed. The head is part of the matrix clause. So the head here is the man. The man whose daughter married Fred or the man whose daughter Fred married but the man is the head and the man is part of the main clause because the relative clause is the part shown in brackets. Okay, so whose daughter married Fred or whose daughter Fred married? The man is not part of that clause. The man is part of the main clause. So this is called externally headed. Now, if people are wanting to ask questions about that, this is something we should do at the end of the lecture. But let's look at another language that does this. So in the Awapit language spoken in Ecuador, part of the Barbacoan language, and this was researched by a former colleague of mine who used to work in the same university quite a long time ago. It's literally, so at, in 14a here, at means came. It's a perfective participle, has come. Mika is the relativizer. So at Mika, which has come, quija, dog, itzu, died. The dog which came died, but the dog is outside of the relative clause because the relative clause is the part marked in brackets. And in the our pit language, you can shift that relative clause to the end of the sentence. So you can say, atmika quija itzu, or quija itzu atmika. And that would be literally, the dog died, which came. The first one is, which came the dog died. And the second one is, the dog died, which came. English doesn't allow those structures. In English, you'd have to put dog, which came died, which is a different order. So these things also vary in order from language to language, quite significantly. But the important thing to remember here is that even though the relative, the subject of the relative clause is no longer inside that clause, it still controls the verb agreement. So there's a mistake here. I should have put a sentence around the second line, uh, uh, brackets around the second, uh, the relative clause in the second one, who are weaving the mats. So just imagine for a moment that there's a bracket around that. So in English, we could say, the woman who is weaving the mats is sitting over there. The women who are weaving the mats are sitting over there. But notice that inside the relative clause, you still have to agree with the subject, even though the subject is outside of it. 
So the women who are weaving the mats. We don't say the women who is weaving the mats are over there. We have to say who are weaving the mats. So the agreement shows that the subject of the relative clause is still the women in the second case, even though it isn't stated. And in Yimas, which is a language spoken in Papua New Guinea, the sentence, the women, or the phrase, the noun phrase, the women who are weaving the mats, does exactly the same thing. You have naikum, women, irut, mat, nampautum, and that is weaving they. But the agreement um is with the third plural and indicates that the subject of the relative clause is marked in the plural even though the noun phrase indicating that it's plural, that is to say the women, is outside the clause. Now most languages have, I think, externally headed relative clauses, but not all. So this example is a bit tricky, number 13, and I hope I can explain it satisfactorily and we'll have a little time for discussion later. So in the Digueno language, belongs to the Yuman language family of California, you have internally headed relative clauses. So in the first, and I won't attempt to pronounce this language, it's a bit difficult, but the first sentence, yesterday house saw past, see past I. So yesterday house I saw, I saw the house yesterday. And the second sentence, house the in, sing will I, exactly the opposite order of English, I will sing in the house, house that in sing will I, they say, ulta pulta, you could say here, I will sing in the house. And what we can see here is um, two things, yesterday house saw I, house the in sing will I, meaning I saw the house yesterday, I will sing in the house. Now, when you combine these in English, the I, the house at least, stays in the main clause. Okay, I will sing in the house. That I saw yesterday. That I saw yesterday is the relative clause. But in Diguenio, they say, yesterday house I saw that the in I will sing. And here the house is inside the relative clause, which is yesterday house I saw. Okay, so can, I, I hope that people can see this distinction. Literally, it means something like, I will sing in the, I saw the house yesterday. Okay, the house is inside the relative clause. Or I will sing in the, that I saw the house yesterday. Something like that. Can't translate this into English nicely. Doesn't work. Because English is an externally headed relative clause language and Digueno is an internally headed relative clause language. And I don't know of the languages that you speak or might be studying what will be happening. Co-relative or double marking I suggested before that you might know a language which does this, and I rather think you will. And this one, um, Hindi, which is not a language that I speak, but something like Jisatmika Kutta Bemarhai Usadmiko Maine Deka. Which man's dog is sick? That man I saw. And here, the man is in both clauses. In English, we say, I saw the man whose dog is sick. You only say man once. So in English, you put man in the second sentence, which is the main clause. In Digueno, which we just saw, you'd put the man in the first one, which is the dog is sick clause. But in Hindi, the man goes in both. I'm not quite sure what Assamese does on this front, but I suspect it would, it may well do it this way as well. So this is, this is sometimes called the co-relative. Um, headless relative clauses are constructions in which the shared argument is not expressed in either clause, just not there at all. And 
these are understood as meaning something like the one who or the one which. And so in our pit, you can say, Atmika, which came, itazi, died. It doesn't say what came or what died. So in English, you'd have to say the one which came died. <coughs> in digueno, because digueno requires the head to be internally, you would have to say um, something like um, which one came died. In Hindi, you'd have to say which one came that one died. But in our pit, you can simply say which came died. And it will have to refer to something and presumably the context um, comes up with this. So one sentence example um, that I was given, got for this was na santos ta piata na, sorry, I'll say it again. Na santos ta piata ta pika, mika ta piantao. I hit who killed Santos. Um, and it's not saying what or who was hit. I hit the one who killed Santos. That is not present, the head is not present in either of the clauses. Okay, so that's what I had in mind to say today about relative clauses. So I'm going to stop.